furthest from you and Kurt here with me. Uh, guys, we're here to talk about motivation, um, but I want to talk to you, Matt, about, you're obviously involved with Dolphins, you're CEO of RSE Ventures. What's the key to being a successful serial entrepreneur? What's the secret? I mean, I think it's cliche, but it's always about people. So if uh, you want to do many times, many things at the same time, you better make sure that you've scaled yourself. So for me, it's always about partnering with the right people who take work off my plate. I always say it's a good day if any of the companies that I've invested in or that I own, that if, uh, if I were to tragically get hit by a car tomorrow, that it would not be that big of an event and that the company would function in my absence. So to me, the goal is always scaling yourself with good people. Okay. And Kurt, you weren't a great high school athlete. You were a Navy SEAL for 13 years and now you're working with the likes of the Miami Dolphins players on peak performance. How does that happen? How does that story come about? Well, it's interesting. So I, I told him the very first day I met with the Dolphins, I said, I'd love to be in your shoes, but they don't want anybody who runs a seven second 40. So, so they said, hey, they don't need me for the athletic part. But I said, you have more talent in your entire body than I have in my, than you have in your pinky. But if you talked about mental resiliency, I'm a pro bowler. Right, so the goal is NFL is a fascinating league where there's a salary cap and the draft, which means there's pretty much an equal amount of talent. So if you want to build a championship team, the key is the arbitrage is mental resiliency, setting the conditions where you can have your peak state available at any given moment. So now every time that ball is snapped, you can have the best player of your life. And that relates to the seals in the way that you guys would focus going into an operation, I suppose. You needed to be up when you needed to be up, and you need about a switch off when you, when you weren't it, kind of in action. Oh, absolutely. Like the first time I jumped on a helicopter for my first combat op, the rest of the team had been on several. And so you know, I got on, and like, my heart rate was about 250, and I was like, this is intense. What are you guys doing? Because everybody was laying back, and they were nearly asleep. And I was like, I, I don't understand. And then as we got about an hour and a half helicopter ride, 30 seconds out, the, the crew calls out 30 seconds, and then all of a sudden, see him turn on, right? And that was the fascinating shift I realized where the whole goal was you had to be able to be at resting heart rate and recharging, recovering, and then the moment you needed it, full go, and then as soon as you called compound secure, you know, back to resting heart rate. And that's, you know, it's amazing football is not a contiguous sport, right? So every single down you have the ability to go, boom, three to seven seconds of explosive energy and then recharge. And it's fascinating. And Matt, I want to talk to you about the variety, the breadth of your interests. How do you stay relevant, uh, respected from one to the other? Because one minute you're dealing with the Dolphins, the NFL, you've got soccer interests in the US, you've hosted massive games there between some of the biggest clubs in the world. How do you ensure that you are respected from one to the other? Well, I think you have to be um, disciplined. You have to make sure that everything you do is worth your time because there's an opportunity cost when you go down a certain road. But my partner, uh, Stephen Ross, has um, been wildly successful in a number of different areas. and. 75 years old, but been successful in real estate and sports. What I learned from him is um, success is largely about connecting the dots. And so it's one thing, everyone likes to have a clean narrative. I only invest in this space and, and I would like to package it, but life doesn't work that way. So the commonality of everything we do is connecting the dots. So what I try not to do is enter into a completely unrelated area where what I'm doing in that area doesn't benefit the whole portfolio. So if you take a step back and you look at drone racing that we're in helping incubate, or you look at um, bringing international soccer to the United States, there's a whole infrastructure of people behind those projects, and they're all working together. So even though it may look unrelated when you're looking from afar, in fact, everything I do in a given day should reinforce something else I do. And if it doesn't, then I'm probably doing the wrong thing. Okay. Let's talk about the future, because yep. you're also like a guy who likes to see what's coming. You like <laughs> yeah. to try and predict what's coming and, and make sure what you're backing is the thing that's going to be successful yeah. in the future. So what is the next frontier for sport? You're going to have to pay me for it. You want, you want, you want the answer to the test? <laughs> These guys are already All done right, that. So the yeah. answer to the test is, uh, it's kind of obvious, so I'm going to say something that most of you probably realize, but I think virtual reality is going to be massive. I mean, and uh, what's interesting is sports is usually late to the party uh, when it comes to tech. Uh, they're mature brands. Sometimes they can behave a little bit with monopolistic power, right, which means they're, relu they're reluctant to change or cannibalize their own business model. I'm seeing something different with virtual reality. I'm seeing sports uh, leagues and teams experimenting on the front end of the innovation cycle rather than wait to the end. And so you're going to see a number of uh, teams experimenting with broadcasting their uh, games or matches in VR. Particularly the NFL is going to do three games. Uh, NBA just broadcast a Warriors game live in virtual reality. And the experience right now is kind of clunky, but it doesn't take a big leap of imagination to look forward three years from now 
and say, like, this is going to be unbelievable. And it's going to open up a whole um, different level of experience for teams. I don't know what the product will be. Will it be some type of subscription product where you're sitting at home with your goggles on? But nonetheless, I think virtual, virtual reality is uh, going to be massive. Do you think the cost of the, I know Google Cardboard has made a big difference already, but do you think the cost of VR uh, for an individual is going to be manageable? Do you think that they're, the public are going to be open to, to taking that on board, to buying what you need to buy, to yeah, I think, I, think I think eventually as the hardware cost comes down, it's not, it's not that expensive relatively right now. Uh, and you look at the success of the Oculus Rift and so forth, I think that you, know, you could imagine buying the device. And then you could imagine a subscription model that'll be similar to OTT models that every league has right now. It's just, to me, what's, what's a more interesting experience? Watching a, a, a game on a small smartphone, which is okay, uh, but or stepping onto the court and being able to look left or right, or going into an F1 car and be able to see what's going on on the track. I mean, it's, it's absurd. So mm -hmm. to me, if, uh, if I had anywhere to invest money, which I just did, by the way, full disclosure, in one of the VR companies, uh, I'd be looking at uh, virtual reality. Okay. And then I'd be looking at drone racing, but you know that. <laughs> well, that's interesting, isn't it? Because drones clearly something that's becoming very mainstream all of a sudden, but you yeah. actually think drone racing. Well, I think, I think if, uh, who would have thought five, four years ago that 100 million people a month would be watching other human, you know, human beings play a video game on Twitch? or that arenas all across the United States would be filling up with 30,000 people who've come to watch other kids play video games. So I, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you recognize that that phenomenon is real and here to stay with eSports, it's not a big leap also to say, imagine you could step into the eyes of a drone pilot who's operating a drone at 100 miles per hour, flying through incredible indoor spaces, uh, and imagine why that's gonna be such compelling content. So I'm excited about drone racing. We, we've been spending a lot of energy trying to incubate that sport, and uh, we haven't announced it yet, but next year there'll be a series of ra races all over the country that take the best pilots from around the world and bring them to show their skill. And what I love the most about it is uh, it's a combination of Twitch meets Formula One. The people who are doing this aren't just hobbyists. They're highly skilled. They have to have quick reflexes. They have to be able to turn on a dime. So for me, it combines the best in sports, technology, uh, content, and so uh, I think it's going to take a couple of years, but, but it'll be a sport. Fascinating. Kurt, I want to come back to football with you. A lot of what you did with the SEALs was about team ethic and uh, togetherness. How do you take a bunch of guys who are so different in terms of backgrounds, body shapes, athletic abilities, and make them into a, a group of guys who want to work together and become a team? Especially when a lot of the time they're not on the field at the same time or they're not uh, pulling in the same direction necessarily. Well, thanks, and it's one of my favorite questions because I don't make them do anything. It's one of the first things you learn about working with 320-pound offensive linemen is you don't make them do anything. But one of the, one of the keys is, you know, in, everyone here knows from the startup world, there's only one moment when you have complete alignment. That's when an entrepreneur has an idea, right? And after that, then you have an organizational goal, you have a team goal, you have an individual goal. And many times, if those are pulling in different directions, then all of a sudden you have the net sum of those vectors is zero. And that's where... You know, in the government, we'd say that got put on the shelf. It wasn't, everybody wasn't trying very hard, but it just didn't go anywhere. So when you're working with a team to get everybody aligned, you have to find out what's the individual objective that allows them to do things that they would never do, you know, otherwise. So in the SEALs, you know, if I go into a room, I go left, my buddy goes right. You know, as we take apart a room, I have a 45 degree arc of fire that's all that matters in life to me which sets the conditions now where I have an 8x mathematical advantage, you're better at math than me, 316 to 45, over the enemy, which means every single time we're split second faster. And so the people will only do something for the team if they realize that that serves their individual goal. So for example, you might have a wide receiver. Wide receiver, what's his goal? Individually, he wants to make the Hall of Fame. He wants to be able to play in more games. Well, the average career is three and a half years. So you say, okay, well, if you want to go to the Hall of Fame, what if we got you four extra games a year? Right, which all of a sudden now means, okay, now, now I've got four extra games a year, then now it's set the conditions where I can shorten my, my time I have to go. Now, what's it take to run a nine route? Two and a half, three seconds? How long does a quarterback have to stand up? One and a half seconds? Well, then does it behoove you to help the offensive line to be able to you know, block for the quarterback long enough to get you the ball? And all of a sudden, from a very individual objective, you have a person that's completely team-oriented, not because I said you need to care about the team, but because I showed them that that supports their individual goals. Right. And as soon as you take each person and align their individual goals to the overarching team objective, then you're off to the races. 
And I think for us, Kurt, Kurt reflects the fact that every sport to some degree, and the NFL in particular, has parity you know, around mm. salary comp yeah. and so forth. There's a salary cap in the NFL. You can only pay so much. But there's no salary cap on innovation, and there's no salary cap on investing in the person. And at a team, we don't make anything. We're not manufacturing wi widgets. We have people, and we have people problems. And so anything you could do to give yourself a competitive advantage by investing in the whole person, that's what Kurt reflects. So it's one thing for me or an industrial psychologist or a Tony Robbins type to talk to the player and try to motivate them. It's another thing to have a guy who has stood in the battleground in Afghanistan talk to them about what it means to lead you know, men into battle. Mm -hmm. There's a different level of credibility that Kurt can bring that he can, he can connect with the player. I want to ask you guys both about off the field behavior and how that kind of relates to star performance or great performance on the field. Do you see a pattern? And if so, what is it? I would say absolutely. And, and it works for businessmen, for entrepreneurs, for sports. It really comes down to alignment. You know, if humans are just an energy system, then the whole goal is to set the conditions where you can have all your energy to bring to bear in any given moment. And so one of the things that we think we, is critical is establishing habits, right? Because if I establish habits, for me personally, I make all my bad decisions after 8 p.m. at night. Right when I've expended I can all my to that. No, right, right. <laughs> when I've expended all my energy, and so the whole goal is set the conditions where if I have habits that allow me to go through the day and reserve my energy for only the things that are most important, then it changes the game. And so we say off the field, on the field. Well, we're just one human, and so it, it matters across your individual life, across your intimate relationships, and across your profession. And that's where fundamentally, if you're aligned in your individual life, if you have great relationships, and if you are loving what you're doing, that's gonna set the conditions where you have a multiplicative benefit of what you're driving. However, if you get to the point where you think each one's exclusionary, then that's the equation where actually, you know, the highest suicide rate in the world is Silicon Valley. Because if you say, well, marriage to self, marriage to profession, marriage to others, well, if you think you have to achieve, you end up sacrificing yourself and sacrificing your relationships to achieve, only to find out that you've sacrificed everyone that would have loved you to, to start with. So I think it's absolutely crucial that you have your energy restored across those domains instead of depleted. One of the things I think, Kurt, you know, we talked before about what can you borrow from the Navy SEALs and what has Kurt uh, imported, not just to the Dolphins, but to uh, my portfolio overall, is this the notion of missing conversations. That if you think about where's a lot of the emotional leakage in any organization, it's having, it's those missing conversations. Things that are left unsaid, where if you allow them to fester, can destroy an organization. So he's instituted a philosophy, and we've embraced it, of creating an environment where there's no room for missing conversations. And I think once you give permission for people to speak to the truth, whether there's, you know, they work for you, or they work alongside you, or they work above you, you can unleash you know, full potential. And like Kurt always says, is, there's no one individual. There's weak state and there's peak state. You know? And so how to optimize the peak state? It's to ensure that nothing is left unsaid. So we've created an environment, I believe, at the team level and across the companies of say whatever's on your mind, speak truth. RSC has been massive in growing the International Champions Cup. Obviously, it's now a big event, biggest clubs in the world. You've been linked recently with Formula One, possibly acquiring that. Tell me a bit about that. Is, is that a possibility? And, and tell me about the parallels between soccer and F1 in the US. Okay, well, I can't get, unfortunately, I can't get too much into F1, but I can wax philosophical about it. It's a wonderful sport. I had to ask. <clears throat> I think the parallel is, if you go back three years ago in the US, international soccer is you know largest sport in the world, but in the US really hadn't been on the, on the map. Um, and it just, sometimes it just takes presenting a sport in the right way. And historically, uh, when uh, Man United and Real Madrid would come to the United States and play a match, it's a meaningless friendly. People don't want to see a non-competitive sport, even if it is the best brand. There's a novelty factor, so in year one, they'll turn out, but by year two, yeah, the novelty will have worn off. So what we did three years ago is say, let's take all these matches, let's go ahead and build a brand, let's build a competitive tournament, and let's build an infrastructure around it, which took a ton of work, that could, do, that could get this content all over the world. So fast forward, last year we had 25 matches taking place in China, Australia, Europe, Mexico, Canada, and the US. And in order to pull that off, I have 500 people around planet Earth who are making it happen. So now look at international soccer fast forward. People are turning in, ratings are up, you know, the sport is gaining. And we're not the only reason by far. The, the NBC deal is a big part of it because it's just as easy to find you know, an, uh, uh, an EPL match now as it is to find a Major League Baseball game. But now look at Formula One. Incredibly popular all over the world, and in the United States, it's barely on the radar, right? And so if you look at a path for F1 about how it could go from where it is right now to where it is, it's similar. Americans have to be exposed to it, so you can't just have one race on the ground. <clears throat> you need consistent, steady uh, you know, presence. So 
you look at the numbers, big picture, there's you know, over 400 million people who are tuning into F1. If it's done the right way in the United States, there's no reason why it can't be huge, in my opinion. Interesting. Right, we're well, running out of time. But I've got a couple, I want a question, I've got okay. to ask you both. You've had a lot of challenges in life. You've overcome a lot of difficulties and, and real trials, I suppose. How do you keep motivated in business if you're starting businesses and perhaps they're not working out? How do you keep that motivation to ensure that in the end you get there? Well, I think Matt just modeled it very well. And, and it's really, how do you model success? How do you maintain that over the long term? And it's really, leaders do three things, right? They just like he painted. First, you see the world as it is. Next, you see the world as it could be. You imagine that future. And then those two phases, though, those are just a wish, right? And so many people will, will have that wish. But then the third piece is make it as you see it, right? And so I think that's one of the things that Matt excels at and one of the things that entrepreneurs that are successful drive is they, one, they, you know, humans are my favorite creature. They're the only creature on the planet. Everything else reacts to whatever happens to them. They're the only creature can look out in the future, create a vision, then manifest into reality. Right? And so that's the secret is now you create that vision and then third, make it as you see it. And I think, and Matt can attest to this, every single time that you take that leap of faith, because you never get to see what it's going to be like when you take that leap of faith, it will never turn out exactly like you anticipated, but it's always infinitely better. And I, if I add one more piece, I think it's the key is failing faster. Now, failing faster is a term I use because most people consider it a failure to have a setback. But if I'm good at one thing is I've failed more than anybody I've known, which means I learn and iterate increasingly faster, which allows me to evolve really rapidly. I think for me personally, you get to a certain point in life and you realize that money's great, money can, money can solve you know, many of your basic problems and meet your sustenance, but at, the, at some point you say to yourself, what, what's the meaning of it all? I get excited, and this is important to keep a goal in mind, I get excited by the idea of using wealth and using it to ameliorate suffering or tackle problems that, that, uh, that I've, I've been exposed to a lot of things in my life. I'm a cancer survivor, I have a child with autism. So what's my big goal? My big goal is, how do I accumulate enough knowledge and resources that I can use that experience and transfer it into another context and alleviate suffering, whether that means tackling autism, whether that means cancer or anything like that. So you need a big goal in mind, is my point, because money, money's not enough. And one closing comment from both of you, I suppose if, if somebody's looking to get into the sports business world, uh, what would be the one tip you would give them, one piece of advice? Well, I think number one, in our world, because people are so passionate about it, you can confuse your hobby on Sunday for your business on Monday. So I think you gotta take a hard look. If you have an idea, ask yourself, are you really driven because you're so passionate about it or is this a business? I get exposed to a lot of things that masquerade as a business, but really they're just a hobby. So don't, you don't wanna spend three years of your life pursuing something that is a novelty, but in reality it's not a business. Assuming that's the case, um, our business, unfortunately, can be really resistant to innovation. So there are those who erect barriers to innovation rather than lower them. You need to grab onto that one you know, person who's going to be your rabbi, who's going to help you navigate the sports world. So I happen to be one of them because <clears throat> I like, you know, the underdog and, I, and, I, and I, I don't care that I have a, you know, great job or I have something that a lot of people would want. I care about the future. I care about helping innovators and entrepreneurs. You need to find that person who could help open those doors because it can be very different in our industry, more different than most, more difficult than most. Okay. For me, I think it's the African proverb, but if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So if you have a brilliant idea or something that you really want to pursue, take not only your own perspective, but now build a team, right? Build a team, because the thing I loved about teams is, you know, I have many weaknesses, but the strength of one person becomes the strength of the entire team, and everyone's weaknesses are compensated for mm -hmm. by the other members of the team. So if you really want to be successful in today's world where there's so much information, it's impossible to know it all, set the conditions where you build the team of all the different things that you think you might need. If you ask me what, what often causes failure, it's not that the idea wasn't perfect, not that the, you didn't have the motivation, but you know, there was one person at the table that could have answered the question that you didn't bring in. So continue, if you don't have the answers yet, find the next person, right? Because eventually you'll, you know, you'll have that 10,000 hours of the unconscious competence to be able to drive it. Kirk Cronin, Matt Higgins, thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you.